Hi, thank you for joining us today for session F1, Discussions on Floodplain Management Policy. My name is Celinda Adair. I'm the state NFIP coordinator for Oregon. And today I'm going to be your moderator. We're going to go through three different presentations today. I'll be introducing each presenter and presentation individually, and then we'll have a Q&A session. One important housekeeping notice, please don't wait till the end of the sessions to put your questions in. Feel free to enter them at any time. It'll actually work easier and make Q&A go a little faster and simpler if they're flowing in through the presentation. So as you feel inspired, feel free to put those in. If you have any questions or concerns or issues, you can also contact the staff for assistance or flag that in through the Q&A process and we'll get assistance to you right away. With that, I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Joel Scatta is an attorney with the Natural Resource Defense Council's Water and Climate Team. He advocates for and develops federal and state policies and programs that help adapt the U.S. to the impacts of climate change. Some of his focuses have been on better public access to flood risk information and enacting stronger flood protection standards. His presentation today is titled Changing the NFIP for a Changing Climate. Update the NFIP's floodplain management regulations. It's an important topic. We look forward to hearing about it now. Hello, I'm Joel Scatta. I'm an attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC. I work for NRDC's water and climate team. Our team focuses on helping communities prepare for and adapt to the impacts of climate change, in particular, increased flood risk and sea level rise. My presentation today is titled Changing the NFIP for a Changing Climate, Update the NFIP's Floodplain Management Regulations. So let's get started. Flooding poses a significant threat to life and property and is the most common natural hazard in the United States. Since 1973, the National Flood Insurance Program, NFIP, has paid more than $69 billion in flood insurance claims, half of which have occurred in the last 12 years. Further, the risk of flooding is increasing due to climate change impacts like sea level rise and changing precipitation patterns, as well as development in the nation's floodplains. As atmospheric gases, greenhouse gases uh, um, continue to rise, flood risk will continue to increase, presenting grave challenges to our nation's cities, towns, and neighborhoods. Congress established the NFIP in 1968 to reduce flood damages nationwide and to ease the federal government's financial burden for providing disaster recovery. To achieve this goal, the NFIP was designed to perform three primary functions. First, the NFIP provides federally backed flood insurance to property owners and renters. Second, the NFIP establishes minimum building, land use, and floodplain management criteria designed to reduce future flood damages that participating communities must adopt to enable their residents to purchase NFIP insurance coverage. And third, the NFIP develops maps that depict certain high risk flood areas, which not only provide the basis for the application of the NFIP's construction and land use requirements, but also inform community planning, the design and construction of infrastructure, and local land use decisions. Congress required the NFIP to have building, land use, and floodplain management criteria that, to the maximum extent feasible, will limit risky development and future flood damages. However, the minimum criteria for construction and land use in flood-prone areas have not been comprehensively amended since the early 1970s. Nor have NFIP flood maps that depict future flood risks been developed despite congressional, congressional mandates to do such. Given the substantial amount of credible scientific evidence concerning climate change's role in increasing flood risk, coupled with growing development in flood hazard areas, the nation cannot rely on a federal program that is failing to adequately account for these impacts. This presentation will describe how smart policy and the law both mandate that the NFIP implementing regulations be amended to adequately account for the increasing risk of flooding due to climate change and future development. Proposed changes to the NFIP's building, land use, and mapping regulations will be discussed. Flood risk is increasing across the United States due in part to increased development in the nation's floodplains and impacts of climate change, such as sea level rise and changing precipitation patterns. Human emissions of greenhouse gases are the primary driver of climate change. The extent to which climate will change depends on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions already released into the atmosphere and those yet to be emitted in the future. Under current policies worldwide, 
the average global temperatures could be 3.8 degrees to 7 degrees Fahrenheit higher than pre-industrial averages by 2100. The global mean sea level has risen about seven, eight, seven to eight inches since 1900, with about three of those inches occurring since 1993. If global average temperatures increase between 4.2 degrees and 8.2 8.6 degrees Fahrenheit, global mean sea level rise is very likely, about 90% probability, to rise by 0.3 to 0.6 feet by 2030, 0.5 to 1.2 feet by 2050, and 1 to 4.3 feet by 2100 relative to the year 2000. Rising sea levels have already exacerbated several threats to coastal communities, including increased tidally driven flooding, larger storm surges, and increased severity of coastal storms. Flooding amplified by sea level rise poses significant economic, social, health, and environmental risks to coastal land, infrastructure, property, ecosystems, and communities. Uh, also, climate change has detectably influenced important drivers of floods, such as rainfall and snowmelt. Well-established relationships between temperature and humidity suggest that warming temperatures increase evaporation rates in the atmosphere's water holding capacity, leading to a higher level of water vapor in the atmosphere. This increases the likelihood of more frequent and intense precipitation events. Heavy precipitation events have been um, come more frequent and intense over the same time period in nearly every region of the country, with the largest changes in the Northern Great Plains, the Midwest, and the Northeast. In 2018, for instance, Climate change made exceptional rainfall across the mid-Atlantic 1.1 to 2.3 times more likely and contributed to months of severe flooding. Extreme precipitation events are expected to get even more frequent and severe as the climate warms. One recent study found that by 2020 to the 2049 period, even a medium emission scenario could increase the frequency of extreme precipitation by more than 200% in some US regions and increase the magnitude of those events by more than 20%. However, even without factoring in the effects of climate change, damages from coastal flooding and inland flooding are projected to increase significantly as the US population grows and development in the flood prone areas expands. In 2010, the US population was 309 million people, almost a 10% increase from the population in 2000. The US Census Bureau predicts that the US population will reach 400 million people by mid-century. Millions of people with estimates ranging from 15 to nearly 41 million are already exposed to significant flooding in the United States. A recent study, Estimates of Present and Future Flood Risk in the Countermonious United States, estimates that 40.8 million people um, in the US, which comprises about 13% of the population, live in a 100-year fluvial or pluvial floodplain. This represents substantially higher exposure than previous estimates suggest. Per this study, projected population growth and increased exposure to floods not only indicate that millions more will be at risk of floods by 2050, but also that population growth is occurring faster in more frequently flooded areas, for example, the 50-year flood zone, compared to less frequently flooded areas, such as the 500-year flood zone. Economic activity, development, and population growth have occurred and are continuing to occur in high flood areas. Given these projections, the NFIP must update the construction and land use requirements to construct such increasing development in flood prone areas and reduce the potential for flood prone damages. So what can be done? Forward looking, construction, forward -looking construction and land use standards and mapping future conditions are proven to reduce flood risk. So designing and constructing residential, commercial and public infrastructure to reduce or to exceed minimum NFIP requirements can reduce flood risk increase safety and prevent property loss. Additionally, such mitigation has been adopted by multiple state and local jurisdictions and is found to be a financially um, sound investment demonstrating its feasibility. For instance, building single family homes to the flood elevation requirements of the most recent international residential code and the international building code, the I codes, in comparison to the NFIP's minimum flood elevation requirement provides a six to one benefit cost ratio. Since 2015, the I codes have required at least one foot of elevation or freeboard above the height of the 1% annual chance flood, the 100 year flood. That, this aspect of the I codes saves $550 million over the long term for every year of new buildings built to the code. 
Even exceeding the 2015 I code elevations requirements for riverine and coastal flooding enjoys a benefit cost ratio of five to one and seven to one respectively. For riverine flooding, every dollar spent to build new homes higher out of the floodplain, up to five feet above the height of the 100 year flood, saves about $5 in costs. For coastal flooding, greater elevation above the height of the 100 year flood for new coastal homes in these zones is widely cost effective. When the incrementally efficient maximum of the increase in building height is assessed on a state level, the aggregate benefit cost ratio, which is the summing of benefits and costs over all the states is approximately seven to one, which means that for seven, that seven dollars is saved for every dollar spent to build new coastal buildings in V and VE zones above the base flood elevation. However, the number of flood damage claims on structures built in accordance with the NFIP's building, minimum building and land use criteria is trending upward. The NFI building and land use requirements are the most widely adopted development standards in the nation as compared to building codes, subdivision standards, or zoning. FEMA estimates that 90% of the US communities identified as having some degree of flood risk participate in the NFIP, which obligates them to comply with FEMA's minimum requirements for new or substantially improved buildings and land use. Yet the NFIP requirements for buildings and structures have remained largely unchanged since 1971 and no longer meet the minimum industry standards for flood safety. And since the early 1970s, there has been an upward trend in the number of annual claims. Specifically, the total volume of annual claims has increased on average by roughly 2,100 claims per year. Even excluding the high loss years of 2005, 2012, and 2017, the total volume of annual claims still increased on average by around 900 claims per year. While pre-firm policies appear to experience claims at a higher rate than post-firm policies, the percent of post-firm SFHA or flood um, post-firm 100-year payments as a percent of all payments has steadily increased. Post-firm claims have rapidly increased in the last two decades, while pre-firm claims have stayed relatively consistent. Amer in 2006, American Institute for Research Study concluded that while the NFIP Building standards do reduce flood losses to new construction under the 100 year flood events. To some extent, the building standards are implemented in conjunction with flood insurance rate maps, which do not account for increasing flood hazards in the future. Thus, while the NFI building standards may generally be cost effective today, their future effectiveness will be reduced as flood maps become obsolete due to changing flood conditions. Revising building and land use standards may be one of the ways to compensate for changing flood conditions in the future. Smart policy in the law both mandate that the NFIP revise the NFIP implementing regulations to adequately account for the increased risk of flooding. Flood losses happen when development and population growth occur in areas prone to flooding. Guiding where and how development and redevelopment occurs in the most effective, is the most effective means to reduce flooding loss. The National Flood Insurance Act, which established the NFIP, vests FEMA with a mandatory duty to periodically develop comprehensive criteria, which to the maximum extent feasible, will limit development of flood prone land and assist in reducing flood damages. From time to time, the NFIP must, on the basis of studies and investigations authorized by FEMA, develop comprehensive criteria, which to the maximum extent feasible, will construct a, de will constrict a development of land, which is exposed to flood damage where appropriate, guide the development of proposed construction away from locations which are threatened by flood hazards, assist in reducing damages caused by floods and otherwise improve the long range land management and use of flood prone areas. So those four um, factors are what the minimum criteria um, uh, that establish building and land use standards must to the maximum extent feasible meet. So state and local governments are prohibited from participating in the NFIP unless those uh, entities have adopted adequate land use and control measures that equal or exceed the comprehensive criteria established by the NFIP. While the NFIP minimum standards do reduce flood damage to an extent, such standards are falling short, far short of the maximum feasible extent requirement mandated by Congress. Further, as required by law, NFIP flood maps must include relevant information from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the United States Geological Survey relating to the best available 
science regarding future changes in sea level rise, precipitation, and hurricane intensity. Um, and any future risk assessment issued by the Technical Mapping Advisory Committee whenever NFIP flood maps are revised and updated. So that means that NFIP flood maps per Congress must be accounting for future conditions, either from NOAA or from the recommendations uh, issued by TMAC. In the context of the overarching mandate of the NFIP, the program is making inadequate progress though in reducing flood damages and guiding development away from locations threatened by flooding. As such, the NFIP implementing regulations should be amended to develop forward-looking minimum construction standards and land use criteria for flood-prone areas to satisfy the congressional mandate and for flood insurance program. The NFIP implementing regulations should be as followed. In terms of building requirements, elevating buildings to the height of the 1% annual chance flood is the primary NFIP requirement to reduce flood risk. Higher freeboard is necessary to ensure public safety minimize flood-related property damage and reduce the financial exposure of the NFIP. However, the NFIP's elevation standard has not changed since its inception nearly 45 years ago. Despite the, shortcoming, despite the current shortcomings with the NFIP's mapping program and the well-documented well impacts on flooding due to climate change and watershed development, the NFIP's elevation standard now lags behind the widely adopted minimum industry standards for flood safely, clearly falling short of the maximum extent feasible requirement mandated by Congress for the NFIP construction and land use requirements. So one of the proposals from ASFPM and NRDC is that non-critical structures, your residential structures and A zones should have a freeboard standard of two feet. So that means that any home, new home or substantially improved home should be built two feet above the height of the 100 year flood plain to account for increasing flood risk and uh, uh, due to climate change. Um, multiple states and NFIP precipitating communities have already adopted a freeboard standard requiring constructors be elevated two feet above the height of the 100 year flood, which clearly demonstrates that a higher freeboard standard is feasible. In addition, benefit cost analysis conducted by the National Institute of Building Sciences, Building Sciences and FEMA have shown that such a standard in riverine areas provides significant cost savings and avoided flood damages. As for E-zones, for non-critical structures in the B-zones, the NFIP should require a higher freeboard standard of four feet above the non-sea level rise adjusted uh, base flood elevation for new construction and for substantial damage or improvements to existing structures. Per a 2008 FEMA study, uh, which is the supplement to the 2006 evaluation of the National Flood Insurance Program, Four feet of freeboard was found to be highly cost-effective in these zones. The additional cost to elevate four feet above the 100-year flood was significantly outweighed by the amount it saved and reduced flood damages both to homeowners and to the program. However, critical infrastructure is another area that needs to be addressed. Um, unlike other FEMA disaster programs, the NFIP does not require a higher level of flood protection for critical infrastructure. The 1% standard is universally applied to all infrastructure types, irrespective of the type of infrastructure. So for example, a critical facility that produces toxic chemicals or a hospital must adhere to the identical flood risk standards as a single family residential structure under the NFIP. For critical infrastructure, the NFIP needs to implement changes. So what we recommend is that um, the NFIP should prohibit new critical infrastructure where practicable from the two with 0.2% annual chance floodplain. Require redeveloped, substantially improved, or new critical infrastructure where location outside of the 0.2% annual chance floodplain is not feasible to be elevated or floodproof to the height of the 500 year flood elevation plus freeboard to account for future conditions, or should be elevated to the height of the historical flood of record, whichever is greater. And three, Critical infrastructure must be able to be accessed and operable during a 0.2% uh, annual chance flood event. And where that is not feasible, require a viable continuity of operation plan. The next area that needs to be addressed is land use requirements. So improvement to the NFIP's minimum land use requirements hold the most potential to constrict development of land, which is exposed to flood damage where appropriate and guide the development of proposed construction away from locations which are threatened by flood hazards. 
we propose that there be a zero lies floodway requirement. So currently the NFIP's regulatory floodway standard undercuts the objectives of the program to reduce flood damages and to improve long range land management. The NFIP's regulatory floodway standard is meant to address the combined incremental effects of human activity known as cumulative impacts in the floodplain by limiting the increase in flood elevations caused by these impacts to one foot above the BFE. In practice, however, the regulatory floodway standard perpetuates an upward trend of increased flood damages because the standard, one, prevents new development when within the special flood hazard area, the 100-year flood zone, that will increase flooding on existing development, avoids amending base flood elevations to avoid new development also being placed at risk, and allows encroachments that can be detrimental to the natural and beneficial functions of the floodplain. By adopting a zero-rise floodway, you can drastically reduce or eliminate the impacts that new development has on increasing flood levels, which in turn can avoid them impacting existing development. Multiple states already require a zero, near zero regulatory floodway requirement, which just demonstrates the feasibility of adopting one in the NFIP. Another area that needs to be addressed within the NFIP land use requirements is subdivisions. So subdivision requirements that are incorporated to the NFIP minimum standards neither steer development away from special flood hazard areas, nor provide a significant level of protection to some of the physical infrastructure and buildings within them. However, better performing states and communities have shown ways to develop subdivisions and other large scale developments in a way that minimizes future flood damages and preserves the floodplain. For example, some communities require that any feature that conveys a water on a tract of land have a 1% chance floodplain identified. And then some also require that the entire building and envelope be outside of the floodplain. This helps resolve the current issue that NFIP flood maps do not identify the special flood hazard areas of all lands that have the potential to be developed. So this could go towards helping avoid future development from becoming flood risk properties or repetitive loss properties by ensuring that even though those areas aren't mapped, that they are being built in a way that accounts for future flood conditions. Another area that needs to be addressed is the mapping program. So most of the flood hazard maps that are used nationwide to determine minimum building design and other floodplain flood plan development standards are at best a reflection of the current flood risk. The issue with using historical risk alone to predict current risk is that these risks will change in the future due to foreseeable factors, such as rising sea levels, heavier rain events, and population growth. In many places, these factors will cause floods to increase in both frequency and severity, putting an increasing number of Americans at risk. NFIP flood maps should incorporate relevant information from NOAA and USGS relating to the best available science regarding sea level precipitation and intensity of hurricanes, as well as incorporate TMAC's future risk assessment and any revision or update of NFIP flood maps. Congress has required this on NFIP flood maps since 2012. Lastly, the program needs to address the mitigation um, aspects of it. So breaking the cycle of flood damage is important objective of the NFIP. As such, the NFIP requires pre-firm buildings. Those are buildings built before the program or the adoption of a flood map for the region in which the building is located um, that are improved design. And so once those buildings are improved beyond a certain threshold or that incur a certain level of damage, such as 50% of their market value, to be brought in compliance with the current flood pay management regulations. The NFIP's increased cost of compliance coverage provides funds up to $30,000 to assist NFIP policyholders who home, whose homes are repetitively or substantially damaged by a flood to satisfy that requirement. So the, uh, to just clarify it a little bit, the NFIP has what's considered a substantial improvement or substantial damage standard. Once a building is damaged or improved by more than 50% of the uh, structure's market value pre-flood or pre-improvement, then that building must be brought up to, um, stand, to the current standard of the NFIP minimum requirements, often that is elevating the building. The ICC provides $30,000 as part of the insurance policy to help cover that cost. Per 42 USC section 4011, or the statute that helps authorize the NFIP, the NFIP must provide policyholders the ability to purchase insurance to cover the cost of implementing measures that are consistent with the NFIP's land use and control measures. However, the cap on ICC coverage needs to be raised because currently $30,000 is falling short of what most projects cost. 
we recommend that cap should be raised to $60,000 and an optional ICC coverage option that exceeds the primary coverage cap of $60,000 for an extra fee should be offered. Much has been learned since the enactment of the NFIP over 50 years ago. FEMA states and communities, FEMA states and communities have learned the strengths and weaknesses of different land use and building standards to reduce flood damage over this time. Additionally, technological advancements to identify and map flood hazard areas have evolved tremendously. The body of science connecting climate change to an increased risk of flooding is clear. Numerous studies, including federal agency reports, prove a substantial connection between climate change and the growing frequency and severity of flood events, which greatly challenge our nation's cities, towns, and neighborhoods. Congress created the NFIP to reduce flood damages and to ease the federal government's financial burden for providing disaster recovery. However, we know flood damages and federal spending on flood recovery are rising exponentially, implying the NFIP program is failing to achieve that primary goal. To reduce flood damages, we need to strengthen the minimum standards and improve flood mapping. And we must ensure that the NFIP is adequately accounting for the impact of climate change increasing development on flood hazards. That mandates that we improve the minimum um, building and land use criteria that communities must adopt to participate in the NFIP. And that is why ASFPM and NRDC filed a petition with FEMA to request the agency amend the NFIP implementing regulations to ensure that programs construction, land use, mapping, and mitigation components account for future flood risk. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. I've got some questions from the audience that we're going to go ahead and ask you, so I'll read them off first here. By adopting a zero rise floodplain, wouldn't that result in effectively prohibiting all development in the floodplain, or wouldn't it at least require an engineer's evaluation in order to perform any work in the floodplain, including extremely minor work? So we looked at um, other communities that have already adopted um, zero rise uh, regulations for the, their floodplains. And there's a few states that, that have them, communities that put them in place. We're not looking to make it overly burdensome to develop, um, but more so to make sure that uh, development can occur in a way that's not increasing the risk to existing development. Um, under the current standard with a one foot rise, um, any property that was already in the floodplain will only increasingly become vulnerable as that floodplain gets built out. And so we see with a zero rise floodway standard that there would be a good way to um, at least make sure that future development isn't already impacting the area that's already developed. Great, thank you. The next question, if adopted, the higher elevation requirement would result in much larger construction costs and remediation costs. How does this requirement fit in with addressing mitigation in the disadvantaged communities we saw in the plenary sessions? Great question. Uh, so thank you for, for that one. The first part for new construction the, the additional cost of building to a higher standard versus already building to the height of the 100 year floodplain is rather minimal. Um, in terms of the additional footage that has to be required for each uh, increase in elevation, the majority of that cost is taken up and already getting to the height of the 100 year floodplain. And uh, um, the per foot increase is, uh, is, is small enough that the benefits from having that higher standard would be greatly outweighed um, or would greatly outweigh the cost. Um, and so we saw it as a way to really make sure that people are uh, better protected and safe. And many communities already have um, higher freeboard standards that have been successful. Uh, for example, certain states like New York and Montana already have a two foot freeboard standard and cities like um, Nashville have a four foot freeboard standard uh, that have really helped uh, better protect those communities without negatively impacting development. As far as retrofitting buildings, I, Yes, going um, a higher level elevation does increase costs. Um, like I said before, it, the biggest chunk is getting to that 100 foot flood standard. But one of the things that we put in the petition was for greater ICC funding to be uh, coupled with that uh, retrofit for substantial damage structures to help communities and help homeowners who are impacted by floods to uh, get to that higher standard with uh, additional money. Great, thank you. Have any conversations occurred on these topics with the International Code Council? Uh, we have talked to ICC um, about the, the uh, proposed petition. We talked to them, um, I believe, or the, about the petition. We talked to them several months ago about just the need for higher standards and pushing for uh, stronger building codes in the, the floodplain. And so we have had uh, conversations with ICC. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Another question, could the growth in post firm claim payments be at least partially due the, to the escalation in values of newer buildings? Really, that's a great question. Yeah, thank you. So for post firm payments as a portion of total payments, the, the graph I showed, I, I believe yes, that partially some of those payments could be due to more value, high valued assets being built. But if you also compare the number of post firm claims to the number of pre firm claims, while the number of pre firm claims um, are, are, are higher than post firm claims, the actual number or percentage of post firm claims is getting bigger. So that's not looking at the dollar value, but just the claim amount. And over uh, time, the number of post firm claims is becoming a bigger portion of overall claims uh, total. And that's where we're starting to see um, that there could be correlation between uh, bigger floods happening due to development and climate change and the need to, to update the standards uh, since they haven't been updated since the uh, early 70s. Thank you. Joel, you provide some very good recommendations. What do you think the probability of FEMA incorporating a one foot free board is? Uh, I can't uh, speak for FEMA, but I would hope that the probability is high. Uh, FEMA has um, long uh, advocated for mitigation measures. A lot of the mitigation assessment team reports that they put out after disasters have called for free board standards, often some of them up to two feet. Um, FEMA also has advocated that communities adopt the most recent edition of the um, international residential codes and the international residential codes have a um, standard, a freeboard standard of one foot. So I would say that FEMA is supportive of freeboard and I would hope that, that it would be open to adopting a higher standard. And I think we have time for one last one. Do you know of any estimates of how much of public assistance money spent as part of declared disasters is used to repair infrastructure built specifically serving post firm floodplain development? That is a, a great question. I think it'd be really interesting to do the analysis on that. Unfortunately, I, I do not know the answer about how much of the PA money has gone to helping uh, post firm development. Okay, it looks like we do have time to sneak one more in. Can you expand on how closely, if at all, does the NRDC and ASFPM work together on these policy issues? I'd be happy to, yeah. NRDC and ASFPM have a, a close working relationship. We um, talk uh, fairly often about just how we can improve aspects of the National Flooding Insurance Program, as well as advocating for more federally funded um, flood protection or federal flood protection standards for federally funded infrastructure. So advocating for reinstatement of Executive Order 13690 and the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. Uh, so we are uh, in pretty close contact with um, ASFPM and, and coordinating a lot of our policy work with them to ensure that we are um, working in a way that benefits floodplain management uh, and working with the experts there. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you being here and you're presenting, Joel. Oh, thank you for uh, listening to me. I really appreciate being here. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presentation. Our next presenter is Petmano Penavong, the Senior Project Manager at Atkins. He has 18 years of water resource engineering and project management experience. He's a flood resilient subject matter expert, and he has extensive knowledge regarding flood risk management, modeling, mapping, and stakeholder engagement. He was formerly a DC NFIP coordinator and was a founder of an award-winning DC Silver Jackets team. His presentation today is titled Shifting from Binary to Graduated View of Flood Risks, Workable and Flexible Minimum NFIP Requirements. Last year, I presented a, a brief history of 100-year standard of the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, I call it for us to rethink about the uh, minimum NFIP requirements in light of upcoming risk rating 2.0. And also it's, it's time for us to, to look at these minimum NFIP requirements after more than 50 years. So this presentation today is a second part of that. And also I wanna focus on a concept of performance-based regulations that may help provide uh, workable and flexible uh, requirements in order to reduce this, uh, reduce losses in the U.S. So uh, content uh, presented today is from my research work and also through conversation and exchange knowledge from national uh, policy expert on the field. So I hope you you are following along. 
to capture from last year, the 100 year standard has a long history as I show here. It was not until the end of 1968 that the 100 year standard was compromised by a policy expert uh, during this Chicago seminar. And uh, the 100 year flood uh, standard or flood elevation or even special flood hazard area has, um, is not. Um, has not become the standard until the, the rulemaking process in 1969 and 1971. Uh, since then, um, there were several attempts to revisit this 100-year standard, either to increase or decrease the standard. As you know, the, the standard has been with us for many, many years and it become federal minimum standards that we are very familiar with. The NFIP was established by the National Flood Insurance Act of 1968. Um, the original intent and purpose of the act provided this flexibility that allows the federal government to, um, to work with um, other state and local government in order to, to make the program work. It also recognized the, the pro program has to evolve when we have better knowledge and better experience over time so that, you know, we can improve uh, the program. Uh, on mapping side, the Act authorized the continued reassessment flood hazards, not only for the flood insurance rating purposes, but also the land use requirements of, of the Act. The NFIP is a volunteer program. I want to emphasize that. So the Congress recognized this concept of federalism that federal government must work with state and local government uh, to implement the program. And also certain power will still with the state and local government in the U.S. Constitution um, the state and local government has this so-called state police power when it comes to uh, establishing and enforcing the, uh, the laws that protect the welfare, safety, health of the public, particularly at this uh, in FIP context is the land use regulations. So last year, I proposed uh, three topics for us to, to think about when we think of, uh, to what we want to do with this minimum enough IP requirements. So this is because of, um, as we know, the, you know, the upcoming risk rating 2.0 with new modeling and mapping technology, and also the needs of, of us or all of us to manage flood risk in a more holistic approach. So these are three topics that I highlighted last year, but um, today I want to focus on the last uh, uh, topic, <clears throat> uh, particularly where our current 44 CFR, it, to me, uh, my opinion is considered it's considered very prescriptive regulations, and that sometimes it hamstring the state and local government to 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 go above and beyond, and also in in some cases it's just hard to even just achieve the original intent and goal of the NFIP. So I want to focus today on this concept of performance-based regulations. This is not to suggest that, you know, it's the right approach for us to take, but it's something that we can explore in order to achieve a uh, risk-informed NFIP. So let's 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 set aside, you know, 10, 15 minutes from now to kind of focus on this, uh, on this concept and kind of forget about uh, the current 44 CFR for now. So you may ask, uh, what what is performance based uh, regulation? Some other people have already created the, uh, an acronym for a PBR. You know, what what is PBR? So uh, to simply explain. The, this is the regulatory approach that focus on the outcome, the, you know, the goal at the end, rather than prescriptive processes and techniques and procedures to, to get there, but more on like focus on the goal and outcome and then allow us to get there in different way. 
So everyone may have seen uh, or even been inside this luxury hotel and casino in Las Vegas. This is this is the most unique uh, buildings in the world. It's not because of the the, the design itself as a shape of pyramid, but the the mechanical smoke management system here that I want to focus on. Um, so under the the building code at the time around early 1990s, uh, which is very prescriptive in nature, the mechanical room at the top of this pyramid would have to decide to accommodate a large number of fans to, to be able to draw the smoke that rises up from the ground level. So furthermore, guests or wh whoever stay at the hotel very, very top level, they will have a hard time to, to get out of the hotel during the fire hazard event and also the the fan the the, the sound of fans it would be very difficult for them to 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 manage so what what the engineers uh, did uh, and or worked with the clark county building department at the time they agree on this performance based uh, approach to design the smoke management system so what what they came up with is a series of fans and and ducts uh, supply the air at a lower level to to push the air and smoke out of the balcony and then circulate inside this atrium to allow it to rise up and and be able to to be exhausted by you know a, a fewer number of um, of fans up at the apex level. So um, this design would, would allow people to have enough time to, to evacuate of the building. That's the one of the goal of the, the design that they said in the beginning. So this is an, you know, just an example of the early application of the performance-based regulation. The, the approach is not new. It has been looked at by many national policy expert, notably a law professor, Kerry Koklianis from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, who I had an opportunity to talk to. And, you know, he has involved with multiple uh, efforts by particular federal government agency to explore the PBR or performance-based regulation in health, safety, and environment regulations particularly. For example, in uh, 2018, funded by Universe, uh, uh, Department of Transportation, uh, Transportation and Research Board, the National Academy of Sciences published a report how to design the safety regulations for high hazard industries. And Professor Koglianis uh, was a big part of that uh, a study and report. So the, the PBR, the performance-based regulation has an pros and cons as you probably start to gather ring here. Um, although they provide you know, flexibility, innovation, things outside of the box, and in some cases probably provide some cost saving for the regulated entities. But if they if they we don't design well particularly what to measure, what what the performance uh, would be, it would have this uh, unintended consequences. Uh, one way to think about it, like, you know, tests, like SAT tests or any other tests, um, I don't want to say a CFM um, exam, but um, you, you, you got the point that, you know, if we so focus on the test itself and then we lose all the concepts and idea and lesson that we want to learn and we, we want to, you know, be avoid that kind of, you know, um, the consequences when we think about this PBR. Um, and uh, there's many examples that I, I has been explore, exploring, and notably um, for the federal at the federal federal level, another big one is in, from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So the NRC has been worked on this concept for many many years. I believe started like early 2000s. So they have been create a framework process for um, for agency. Uh, regulations and guidance and also oversight process. They, they came up with framework, as you see here, and process to go through. So 
in order to, in order to do that, they they has been exploring the, the this pro probabilistic flood hazard assessment to be able to support the risk informed the performance based framework to be able to quantify risk and be able to measure and monitor it. And as you know, we have been using the PFRA, the probabilistic flood risk assessment, uh, to support the risk rating 2.0. So there's that's a lesson here that to be learned from NRC. Another example from the from the state uh, level, last year in December, Hawaii Public Utility Commission issued a decision to adopt this comprehensive framework of utility regulations. So they set out three big goals and uh, desired outcome that tie into them. For customer experience goal, they have an outcome of affordability, right? Set very high level. For the utility performance, they set an outcome of efficiency. How can we be efficient with, with utility, utility performance? And I like the, the think about the societal outcome in terms of greenhouse gas emission reduction goal and also being resilient. And that's something that you know we we really we are we care about. Internationally, you know, uh, looking at the 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 Dutch the, the, in the Netherlands under the Dutch Delta program, the the flood risk management set up this very specific uh, outcome or or goal saying that by 2050, the probability of death due to flooding will be reduced in to one in 100,000 per year in every resident living in behind the levee. So this very specific, the reason that I think that we're able to do because they have very comprehensive flood modeling and, and system to be able to quantify and uh, monitor this progress. So you are interested more, um, the Dutch Delta program issued a report in 2020 to tell us the, the progress there, there on this um, program. So let's let's bring it back to the NFIP. Uh, a question here: Would this PBR performance-based regulation work with with the NFIP? As asking in another way, how can we apply this PBR approach with the NFIP? A short answer, I think here is, is yes. I think it it would work because of these following, right? Um, as I mentioned earlier, our knowledge experience has gained so much in the past uh, 10 years, particularly not, you know, when we think about the 1968, and I mean, in the past 50 years, we have gained so much knowledge and experience looking at the technology that we can do with this risk quantification. Now we talk about identify or, or having hazards and risk at, at individual building. So, so the knowledge, there and the technology is there to help us to be able to apply this concept. Also, the performance can be defined and measured and monitored through this enterprise risk management um, that currently the TMAC, the Technical Mapping Advisory Council this year is exploring the concept. If we can define what we want to measure, what the, what the performance would be and how to measure and monitor it, this PBR would be part of that, would be an element of that concept of this big framework of enterprise risk management. Lastly, um, we have come a long way to, to recognize that we must reduce not only economic, but also social and environmental losses, right? Uh, we not just focus on economic anymore, we think more about the social, the environmental component of it. And in order to do that, I think the PBR would be part of that conversation and help us to, to get there. Um, however, um, we still have uh, several questions or multiple questions that we need to explore together and, and to find an answer for it. And I list two big ones here. Who are, who are our in the context of NFIP, who, who are our regulated entities? In my example earlier for the NRC, they have this, you know, um, 
nuclear power power plant, right? Company or private sector that that own and manage them. That's their regulated entity. I'm talking about Hawaii Public Utility Commission. They have utilities company that are the regulated entity or even the, in the Dutch contact, you know, we have the water board that manage the flood risk management program or, or any projects and program behind the le levy system. For the NFIP, for us, are we talking about a watershed based sort of governing governing body to be the uh, regulated entity? Are we talking about the state level? Are we talking about in FIP communities level, or even like individual building homeowners, property owners, are we, do we want to go down to that very, that very, very, very um, small scale to, to regulate? So that's something we need to kind of uh, think about and, and discuss uh, uh, together. Uh, the second question, what are we measure? What are the measure of the NFIP performance? Um, are we using this uh, REST AAL, the average annualized loss that we were able to calculate for each individual building? Or you, we, we want to use the risk score you know, of each building, like what flood factor by the First Street Foundation were able to produce? Or are we want to look at the community level, like CRS classes or credit point? Do we want to set that every community has to be at class seven or above or you know, something like that. I think we need to start to talk about, and and I understand that this is not an easy question to 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 answer. We need we need to bring all level of governments and experts to be able to discuss and and agree on these answers. However, um, good news that uh, good news is that. Our technology, our knowledge are on our side. We have data and tools to be able to help, help us achieve this original goal of NFIP. So we, we have the data and tools. So I think it's just a matter of getting together and be able to design and, and, and come up with something that we can, we can work with. So with that, um, I wanna sort of sum up in, three key takeaways here for you. Um, first, risk informed in FIP is possible because of, as I mentioned, our knowledge and technology is with us. We have that in order to quantify the risk. But in order to achieve that, a new framework is needed to better connect all these programs, particularly the, the NFIP uh, program like mapping, floodplain management, insurance and mitigation, we have to find a way to connect them better and to be able to inform each other. And if we wanna set the goal and objective, all of these need to work together to be able to achieve that. And the PBR, the performance-based regulation would be a tool to be able to help to connect them better um, they because they are, provide flexibility innovation and save costs but uh, a caution is that we need to think through what we want to measure to make sure that it's is adequately defined measure and uh, also monitor in order to make it work so with that, um, thank you for your attentions and I'm looking forward to getting your feedback and answer uh, some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation. We're gonna start the Q&A. The first question I have is how would you envision the changes to the minimum standards under PBR I don't know that I even understand how to phrase PBR regulations. Thank you, thank you for the questions. Um, I'm glad that we have this uh, presentation at the end of uh, to, today, and also we have a chance to to see, uh, to view other presentations yesterday and earlier today. So you probably heard, you know, risk rating 2.0 is coming out. You um, heard about it future flood risk data, the new, you know, the, the, the envisioning sort of uh, FEMA flood mapping program. And also, you know, a lot of things that, that 
seems to is coming right it, that does that seem to be like the, the the future of of the program so this this concept kind of kind of step back to look at how can we achieve those vision right want to be the risk informed in fip we we can't um we can kind of maintain the the same regulations that we have for 50 years. And yes, it's going to be challenging. They're going to be, you know, I'm not talking about it's going to happen in a year or two. You know, there will be some transition, but this is a way to, to bring, to step back and look at all these components of NFIP, right? Mitigation, insurance, and regulations, how we can tie together better. And, and this concept, to me, it maybe is a way to look at if we want to update our regulation minimum uh, um, and FIP require, requirements. What what are things that we can do with it? You know, maybe you know we're going to move from graduate graduate view of flood risk, and you know the increase the fee board may not make sense anymore. But this is a way to kind of step back and let's work together. Use the concept that you know all the all level of government has to work together because FEMA and the federal level really need the uh, the, the community to to be part of this. Thank you. Uh, next question is: Is the performance based regulatory approach supported by the current and or previous administration? Um, yes. Uh, to answer that, and and I didn't include that into my presentation. The um, back in 1993, Executive Order 12866, President Clinton issued an executive order, actually asked the agency to to go to to do this, right? To to look at the alternative, how how we can have this kind of performing. A, objective in the regulation when, when agency try to come up with regulations kind of think outside the box rather than looking at specific thing that you know regulatory agency want to do let's looking at something that we can we can achieve the goal better and this that executive order was acceptable and um, enhanced or later on and also was retained by President Bush and President Obama enhanced it in executive order 13563, again, 13563. So, um, so it has been maintained um, this concept to, to ask the agency to look for the alternative, the performance-based kind of approach. Uh, in fact, um, in the previous administration in 2018, the, um, the US Department of Commerce, the national Telecommunication Information Administration, NTIA, issued a, a, um, a request for comment, for public comments to help them to deal with con consumer pri privacy kind of regulatory scheme using this kind of uh, approach, a performance-based approach. Um, one of the objectives they want to promote is the innovation. How can we balance between the privacy of the consumers and also promote the innovation on, on the uh, issue. So yes, it's been supported by both um, parties, both administrations. Thank you. Next question is, the development community really wants concrete regulations, so they have a consistent standard to plan for. Maybe hard to sell them to buy into flexible minimum requirements, even if it ends up being better for them. Do you have any suggestions on strategies or approaches? Um, that could be utilized to help promote these. Well, um, yes, I understand. You know, we we you know um, we want something. We want to have certainty, right? I mean, uncertainty sometimes it it, it costs more money, but um, but this concept had been used before, right? We, we we kind of have in this kind of uncertainty world, like the example I just gave, I just gave in the presentation and the design. Of the, that hotel and a lot, a lot of, particularly on 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 the building design thing that you know we need some, some flexible tool to be able to achieve. I think it it's a learning curve. It is it is something that we we can train. I think as long as we be clear, what what we want to get out of it set in in the beginning, I think everyone would come along. And and I understand that you know we we have been doing this for many many years for 50 years it's hard to change but sometimes, you know, 
op have an open mind about it, right? Like it changes, it, it might be a good thing sometimes. Thank you. Uh, next question I have is how would PBR affect smaller communities with fewer resources who struggle with standard minimum requirements? How can PBR be adapted to not overburden struggling communities? Um, yes, um, this is probably tying to the, the conversation equity uh, that we had this week as well. While we kind of looking at, you know, how we can design a program or the regulatory scheme or the program that, that address this issue, um, maybe part of the performance that we try to say, we need to look at how we can incorporate the social benefit into the program, into the goal, into the, uh, the performance that we try to set. And that, you know, have this conversation about a com small community and, and, you know, vulnerable community. How can we achieve that part of that performance that we try to, to set? And, you know, technical assistance and, you know, some targeted something uh, financial assistance that we need to kind of build into this this concept so that so that we 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 can address the smaller and vulnerable communities and again um we need to kind of think kind of broader too right we 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 have we need the reason that I brought this concept up because of the technology that's the main thing too that we have the technology to be able to get the better data, understand risk, thinking about risk rating 2.0 or, you know, something that you may not know what's going on with risk rating 2.0, you can think about flood factor, right? We, we are able to understand the risk at each individual building. We can put a number on it. We can put a score on it. We can put the, the, the value, the damage value into it. And that would help us to kind of be able to set this performance so that we can be able to measure. And that, you know, I think that the next step would be how can we incorporate social and environmental benefit into part of the performance. Right now, the way that we have the regulatory uh, system that we have in this program, it's just been too long. It's created 50 years ago where, you know, think about technology back then, not even like 50, but you know, 10 years ago, right? I mean, we used to drive from point A to point B looking at paper map. Now we have a Google map or, you know, even the Google map suggests you to different kind of path to get there so that you can pick and choose. And also you can deal with the traffic and other things. I think our technology is there to be able to help us to, 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 to rethink about a program that would you know allow us also to think about the equity issue the vulnerable communities and how we can incorporate the social and environmental benefit into into this performance as a as a whole okay, thank you very much well, i'm afraid we've actually run out of time for more questions at this point but we really want to thank you for your presentation and your time very interesting thank you all right with that we're going to move on to our final presentation our final two presenters are Stuart Adams, who's an Associate Project Manager and Structural Engineer with Stantec, specializes in hazard resistant design and mitigation. He's also the STAR2 Joint Venture Building Science Program Area Manager and works with the Building Science Branch of FEMA. He was recently the Contractor Lead for Puerto Rico Mitigation Assessment Team and Wind Region Development Efforts following Hurricanes Irma and Maria, and is a subject matter expert for community resilience. He's also very passionate about community engagement. Our other presenter is Dr. Carol Friedland. She's a CFM and a professional engineer. She's an associate professor in the Burt S. Turner Department of Construction Management at Louisiana State University. Her research focuses on the cost effectiveness of wind and flood resilient homes. Dr. Friedland serves on the ASCE 24 committee and ASCE 7 flood load subcommittee. Their presentation is the compelling case for residential flood resistant construction appraisal addendum. And we'll play that now. Good afternoon. I would like to start this presentation with a question. Did you know that a recent paper published in the National Academy of Sciences concluded the current housing market does not price homes efficiently based on their flood risk and overvalues homes within the special flood hazard area by $50 billion? Today, we will be presenting on a critical gap 
and significant opportunity to better value flood risk and flood mitigation in the U.S. housing market through the implementation of a residential flood resistant construction appraisal addendum. This presentation will demonstrate how the appraisal standards can be augmented to better evaluate homes based on their flood risk and reward homes that implement flood mitigation actions, such as additional freeboard. I'm sure many of you have experienced the complex process of purchasing a home. And for folks that have pursued this in the booming market of 2020 and 2021, I hope you were successful in your efforts. A home purchase includes numerous stakeholders at each step, each with their specific role and each with their specific goal, standard, or objective to follow. Today, I would like to focus on a stakeholder often at the center of this process, the appraiser. The Uniform Residential Appraisal Report is the industry standard form used by both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for single family home appraisals. This report includes three separate valuation methods. The first, the sales comparison, which is most commonly used for existing homes. This involves identified comparable homes, looking at their features, looking at their condition, and looking at their neighborhood, then making some informed adjustments, weighing the different comparables, and informing a value. There's also the cost approach, which is often used in new construction, that looks at the cost to build new, as well as the cost of the land. Finally, there's the income-based approach, which is most relevant to rental properties. The current form includes limited flood risk inputs. An appraiser is required to indicate if the home is in a special flood hazard area to determine if flood insurance is required for the property. However, guidance to truly evaluate the flood risk and flood mitigation actions are limited, despite strong value propositions that we will discuss later in this presentation. A similar absence of guidance to evaluate energy efficiency features of homes was previously recognized. To address this, numerous stakeholders, including the Department of Energy, partnered with the appraisal industry to develop the standards, guidance, and trainings to address that knowledge gap. The energy efficiency industry has capitalized on the additional features input under the improvement section and created a template for flood mitigation advocates to follow a similar path to success. In 2021, the Appraisal Institute developed an addendum to the Uniform Residential Appraisal Report to better quantify green and energy saving features of a home. The green and energy efficient residential appraisal addendum helps capture cost savings and consumer preference for these features and standardizes guidance for evaluating them into the appraisal. The addendum references existing standards such as the Home Energy Rating System Index the National Green Building Standards, and the U.S. Green Building Council LEED certification levels. A la carte energy efficiency features such as SEER ratings for HVAC systems or wattage for solar panels can also be documented. There is a 200-page manual that accompanies the addendum to assist appraisers in determining the value of home energy efficient improvements. Typically, a builder, architect, engineer, or energy consultant completes the addendum, and then an appraiser assigns value to the features based on established guidance and professional judgment. The green and energy efficient residential appraisal addendum and its accompanying guidance is actively used in today's market where 6.5 million housing units were sold in the US in 2020 alone. Home sale prices in April 2021 are already up 18% this year. This is due to many factors. One such factor is the increase in sale of homes with solar panel systems. Those can be considered in the appraised value. A recent study from Zillow in 2019 concluded that installing solar panels can increase a home's value by 4.1% or approximately $10,000 for the medium home value in the US. In New Jersey, the increase was documented at 9.9% or $33,000 per home that was evaluated. That's truly significant. Properly appraising homes for their energy efficient features is important. And the standard to do this has been established during the past decade. Fannie and Freddie 
are assuming billions of dollars of mortgages that include items such as solar panel value. Fannie and Freddie are also lending on homes with significant flood risk. And based on many defensible studies, the market and the appraisal process does not adequately price flood risk nor reward flood mitigation in the appraised value of a home. This is concerning and creates significant risk exposure to taxpayer-backed companies. Fannie and Freddie are government-sponsored entities that support the housing market by buying mortgage loans, repackaging them as mortgage-backed securities, and then reselling them. The vast majority of single-family homes that are purchased in the U.S. are backed by Fannie and Freddie. Fannie Mae, in its 2020 10K report, a required SEC filing, stated that flooding poses one of the greatest risks to its portfolio. An additional concern is private lenders are actively moving their loans exposed to flood risk to federally backed Fannie and Freddie products faster than their other mortgages. This is increasing taxpayer risk. Using the green and energy efficient residential appraisal addendum as a model, we propose to address this critical issue of flood risk and protect taxpayer dollars by developing a flood resistant construction residential appraisal addendum and accompanying guidance manual and curriculum. Cost savings of insurance premium reductions from items such as Freeboard, as well as consumer preference to have a resilient home can be documented and used to augment the appraised value. The approach is not punitive, as the proposed addendum only adds value to a home based on flood mitigation features. However, over time, the addendum, addendum should recalibrate the housing market to better price flood risk and flood mitigation. Example flood mitigation actions that could be documented and considered for valuation in the appraised addendum include home elevation and freeboard, elevation of utilities and engineered flood vents, other considerations like community rating system, CRS discounts could also be included. Collectively, insurance savings, consumer preference, and losses avoided would be considered for appraised value based on flood mitigation actions. In economic terms, this is an externality, a kind of value that is not currently priced in, but could be. The addendum allows the market to reward the builder who constructed with additional freeboard, as well as an existing seller who made a resilient retrofit to add engineered flood vents. Both can sell the home for additional value to recoup cost. The buyer also benefits from a more resilient investment with monthly cost reductions on insurance. There's also other potential stakeholders, such as a realtor who can promote houses and quality of life with a flood resistant home. Finally, this benefits the broader housing market as we create an economic incentive to invest in resilience without ad introducing additional government regulations or requiring costly subsidies. We wanted to present a quick case study that demonstrates the economic value of freeboard construction. This research is supported by Louisiana Sea Grant and is a project where Monica Ferris at the University of New Orleans and her team and my team at LSU were looking at the incentives and barriers to freeboard construction. One of the builders that we talked with during the interviews for this project stated that the, if the economic argument made sense, then everyone would want to elevate. And this really served as the impetus to demonstrate the economic argument and how that makes sense within the context of the residential flood resistant appraisal addendum. So we're looking at a new 2000 square foot home with an estimated construction cost of $155 per square foot. Now, looking at the multiple return period flood depth grids and their corresponding average annual exceedance, the depth above the ground, we can translate this into the depth probability relationship. So we simply plot these annual exceedance probabilities on the x-axis 
the depth above the ground from the flood depth grids on the y-axis, change this to a logarithmic scale, and we can fit a trend line where we can derive the properties that describe this depth probability relationship. By multiplying this by a depth damage function, here we're showing USACE, but you can use any depth damage function, we can then develop this probability times loss, which represents risk. So if we take the area under this risk curve, that is equal to the average annual loss or AAL. And that AAL is a stable estimate of losses over a long period of time. Now, if we look at and contrast the amount of risk, the AAL that we would anticipate at the BFE with what we would anticipate with freeboard of one foot, we can see that that AAL dramatically reduces even more at BFE plus two. And if we look at the tail end of this, we can see that for BFE plus three, that risk or average annual loss is very much minimized. Now, another of the savings aspects that Stuart mentioned was the savings on the NFIP premiums. Um, this just demonstrates the amount of premium savings within the A zone and contrasts that with anticipated monthly payments, which would be part of a mortgage payment, uh, considering that that free board is included in the appraisal and included in the purchase price. So we use the 2020 NFIP flood insurance manual, um, acknowledging that this does need to be updated for risk rating 2.0 when we have that information. And we used a 2.3% increase in the home price per foot of free board. And that translated into about a $7,000 increase in construction cost per foot of freeboard. And I think for the type of foundation that I had shown at the beginning, that might be a little bit high. Um, typically, that might be more in line with um, some other foundation types. But if we look at this cost and the increase in monthly mortgage payments, we see that the savings from the NFIP premium is greater than what it costs to elevate. And so we are looking at having monthly savings on the order of 30 to $60 um, that is real money that homeowners have in their account each month because their home is elevated. And I think that's one of the things that I really want to take away from this case study is that considering NFIP premium savings alone in the special flood hazard area, Freeboard pays for itself um, in most cases. And that does not even include the reduction in flood losses, uh, the direct flood losses from buildings and contents that we can derive through the AAL. And it also doesn't include those other factors that Stuart mentioned, loss of heirlooms, um, time off work and displacement, also the health and mental health aspects of flooding. And so the next step here is really to position this information on savings into a framework that we can then translate as a stable communicator of the benefits of free board, just like with the green and energy efficient residential appraisal addendum. Uh, I'd like to talk just briefly about evolving consumer preference and information sources. And I have to start this with an acknowledgement of the availability of multiple return period flood depth grids. Uh, as a floodplain manager, this is something that I think we all need to be endorsing, supporting, advocating for, because without those multiple return periods, we are stuck with estimating losses at the 100 year. So any efforts to model, disseminate, map those multiple return period flood depth grids, I think we should really support that. If we look at consumer preference, we see this a study from the University of Alabama where fortified designated homes sold approximately 7% higher than non-fortified homes. And fortified is a program of IBHS or the Insurance Institute for Building and Home Safety. As we know, realtor.com has recently integrated the First Street Foundation flood risk factor into their website. So people who are looking for homes can know about and become educated about their flood risk before moving forward in that process. The project that Monica and I are working on, we are building a website at LSU, floodsafehome.lsu.edu, 
Uh, you can go to this site and find information about the savings similar to what I presented in the case study. And this is currently funded for three coastal parishes in Louisiana. Um, we have about one year left on the project, but if you go there and have any comments, please feel free to leave those. Uh, there's a survey link that you can leave those, or you can also email me. And then another project that I'm involved with is funded by the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine Gulf Research Program. This is headed up by Chris Emmerich at the University of Central Florida, looking at um, building resilience, home resilience and community resilience. Um, hazardaware.org is the site. And this just right now has information about the project um, and that will be populated with information about AALs for multiple hazards and what steps people can take to reduce, reduce those risks. So we are see, seeing consumers preferring resilient homes and we're also seeing the information sources becoming available that support these types of decisions. Currently, flood risk reducing features are not efficiently conveyed to the appraised value of homes. We could change that with a flood resistant construction residential appraisal addendum that would capture the added value from insurance savings, losses avoided, and consumer preference for stronger homes. The addendum and accompanying guidance would enable the market to reward the builder who employs flood mitigation techniques for new construction. As Carol mentioned before, a builder in Louisiana specifically stated a disconnect with freeboard value exists in the market where the nominal costs to construct do not easily convey to the buyer. The appraisal addendum can help resolve this. Additionally, a seller who invests in the purchase of a home with flood mitigation retrofits would also benefit. Also, a buyer could benefit from a lower interest rate due to a better loan to value or debt to income ratio based on a higher appraisal. Also, future insurance savings and peace of mind from stronger homes would be notable. Finally, the homeowner who uses a home equity loan for retrofits would definitely benefit. I would like to pause on this item as I believe this has immense potential. A homeowner who invests in flood mitigation, such as elevating your utilities or installing engineered flood vents using a home equity loan would not require immediate out-of-pocket expenses or even an HMA grant. Companies in the flood mitigation industry could capitalize on this to offer creative products that limit direct costs to homeowners. Finally, there's a larger scale vision of the addendum's impact. It normalizes the market by allowing prices to more closely reflect vulnerability and resilience. The addendum would only reward homes with flood mitigation features. This is not a punitive addendum. It's essentially a net positive for all involved. But as home value for flood mitigation is better communicated into appraisals, the market should correct the current issue where many homes with flood resistant construction are undervalued and homes with more vulnerabilities to flood hazards are overvalued. The key stakeholders for augmenting the appraisal process include the Appraisal Foundation and the Appraisal Institute. The Appraisal Foundation was congressionally authorized in 1989 as a source of appraisal standards and provides voluntary guidance on recognized valuation methods and techniques for all valuation professionals. In 2011, the Appraisal Foundation established a memorandum of agreement with the Department of Energy, which has led to significant advancement in appraisal valuation for energy efficiency. ASFBM should pursue a memorandum of agreement with the Appraisal Foundation to collaborate on improved appraisals and also partner with the Appraisal Institute, the developer of the Green and Energy Efficient Residential Appraisal Addendum, to work with their professional standards and guidance committee to develop a flood resistant construction residential appraisal addendum. Collectively, this effort would influence trillions of dollars worth of mortgage investments and lead to a more resilient US. Thank you very much for that great presentation. Um, Dr. Friedland isn't able to join us for the live Q&A, 
but we have Stuart Adams here with us. So I'll ask the first question. How universally is the energy efficiency appraisal addendum used across the US? That's a great question. Um, the green and energy efficient uh, appraisal addendum is only really called upon when a uh, builder or homeowner is truly informed of the energy efficiency features. Um, the Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac uh, Universal Residential Appraisal Report does have some specific call outs for energy efficient that see that can be just immediately put into the form. And uh, what it is is when a, a homeowner or engineer or architect is informed that there are special energy features, they can call upon the addendum, which then uh, triggers the need for a uh, appraisal professional uh, that's educated on, on filling out the addendum. And I think they have to do about 30 hours worth of course training, uh, but it, it's used throughout the United States. Um, I think it's more that the basis of developing the addendum has just helped evolve energy efficient uh, valuation of homes. And the, the actual addendum is not used as often as they anticipated, but the, uh, the, the, the valuation tool manual, it's a 200 page book that helps appraisers evaluate the energy efficiency features. My understanding that's used very readily. And, and also I think as more homes have um, solar panels or other specific energy efficiency features, I think you'll start to see this addendum used even more. And I wanted to clarify that the addendum has been out since 2011. Thank you. Next question I have is for substantial improvement, substantial damage. Um, would this affect when instead of traditional market appraisals, communities require actual cash value or replacement cost appreciated? I think what I mean is how would this affect that situation? That's a good question. Um, I think just the way to take this is this is a, uh, an addendum that can be called upon when it benefits um, the homeowner or benefits the builder. It's not necessarily something that has to be used, uh, you know, every time a, uh, a house is appraised. And so um, I think that's the best way to approach it. And I think uh, there's many different stakeholders that are involved. And I think there's many of them that would truly benefit from this. Thank you. So I've got another question for you. What do you see as the next steps? So the next steps. Um, so the Appraisal uh, Institute is the one that created the uh, Green Energy Efficiency Addendum. I've reached out to them. They're very interested in pursuing a, a flood version or even a multi-hazard version. Uh, but it requires a lot of work. Um, so there's the development of the addendum. Um, there's the development of evaluation manual. There's potential curriculum for appraisals, uh, appraisers to do this uh, work. So it's not something that can be done just by an individual or even just a small team. It has to be truly pursued at a larger level. Um, in 2011, the Department of Energy partnered with the Appraisal Foundation, and that helped uh, be a catalyst to them getting to the finish line. And so I think there needs to be a strong push from FEMA, from Institute for Insurance and Business, uh, Business and Home Safety. I think ASFPM can play an active role. So I really think it's a very, uh, the doors are open um, and I think they're ready to be taken. Um, there's a template for us to do it and it just really needs to have good, strong backing. Well, I think there's lots of interest expressed so far in the comments. I've got another question for you. How can this impact vulnerable communities? So that's a good point. So uh, again, this is intended to be a, uh, an additive component to appraisers. So uh, a vulnerable community member might already own a home. And so they might be looking at doing a, a retrofit to their home, but it might be a distinct uh, cost that they're una unable to do. So there's a company, I believe it's out of South Carolina, it's called My Smart Home that understands that when they replace a roof with a more resilient roof, they can get insurance discounts and they kind of proactively take out a second mortgage, essentially a HELOC on the home to do the, uh, the new roof. And, and they use the insurance savings that come over the next decade to help pay that off. So it's no out of cost uh, to the homeowner. And so I think the same thing could be done for a vulnerable community member who wants uh, to elevate their home or add engineered flood vents where they could work with a, a team such as, you know, SmartVent or somebody else like that in the, in the community and uh, in industry and, and get a retrofit uh, to help protect their home and, and their recognized insurance savings would, would be there and be used to help pay off the loan. And then also you would be able to take out the HELOC with confidence because the appraised value of your home would be increased when you receive those mitigation actions. So it's part of just the overall flow of how 
the housing market works. And it, this is one of the missing pieces right now. That's great. Thank you very much for that answer and for this presentation in general. Um, there's been a lot of positive comments on here, and I'll just note one of them. Um, they think it would be really amazing. There's many residents that buy in here. They're in a special flood hazard area, and they don't always know everything that entails. And so there's a lot of good feedback here of how beneficial this would be. Um, that's all the questions I have at this moment. I have a lot of positive comments. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? You know, I think uh, the, the presentation kind of talked about it generally and then got in the weeds a little bit for a few examples. But I go back to the Louisiana example where uh, a builder says uh, in Louisiana, where I'm originally from, where, you know, there's often some conservative approaches to things. And they say if a if, if they could sell the home for the additional cost of free board, it'd be a no brainer because they are they want to help the community. They want people to have long term health and well-being in the homes that they're building. But they've had a disconnect where if they build a home without, you know, with just one foot of free board and then next door they build a home with two free to feet of free board, they're not really selling for anything different. So that small nominal cost they're not doing when they could do it right from the get go. And if that could be uh, put into the appraised value, I think they would uh, they would they would do it. It's, it's a no brainer. And I think this would help push the, uh, the envelope of uh, flood mitigation throughout the U.S. And I think it really truly could influence trillions of dollars worth of transactions. And there's one other thing. Um, they asked if you have a link to the My Smart Home Company in South Carolina. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure to, to send that out. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your presentation. Um, I agree with all the positive feedback coming through the chat. It's very well done. And that wraps up our presentations for this session. Thank you everybody for coming and participating and taking time out of your day. It's been a great honor to be your moderator today. And with that, we'll wrap it up.